Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sayyid Hussain Ali. I am 22 years old. I was born and raised in London and I recently graduated from the University of Westminster, London. Currently at the moment, I'm uh, running my own fast food franchise in East London. So Imam Hussain to me since a young age was a very inspirational character. I mean, my parents obviously named me Hussain. So for me, it was always a curious thought in my mind. Okay, you know, they named me after this certain individual. So who is this individual? And, you know, maybe for, so from a young age, I thought I could relate a lot to Imam Hussain. But how this was embedded within me was through, of course, my, my father and my mom taking me to Majlis since a very young, young age where I can even remember being picked up from, you know, from nursery and, and reception and being taken to the Imam Barga. And I'll be, I'll be playing with, you know, little toy cars and stuff. And I still have those nostalgic thoughts in my mind where I remember me being in the ladies section and then you know slowly slowly progressing and going to the you know to the to the men's section and seeing the way azadari happens and it obviously first it started off as you know you know the 10 days yearly you know the jashans wilads milads and through these experiences and events that i had attended thanks to you know my parents you know i discovered that you know imam hussein was truly someone that every single person looked up to, every single person was talking about Imam Hussain. It was like as if Imam Hussain had some magnetic force where so many people around me, you know, they, they all were chanting the name of Imam Hussain, you know, where after Majlis, you know, we'd see people, you know, mourning and expressing their sorrow for Imam Hussain. So growing up, seeing that happen was like, okay, you know, what's this? So that curiosity just grew every year, year by year, year by year. I think one major thing that played a role in creating love in my heart for Imam Hussein was understanding poetry. A lot of people understand Imam Hussein in many different ways, but for me, it was always poetry because I always saw poetry as a way to express your true passion from your heart. So I always saw Imam Hussein in the most beautiful ways, in the most beautiful, valiant ways that Imam Hussein salam, was described. So of course, um, you know, attending the regular Muharram programs and then, you know, as I grew up, you know, I slowly, slowly, you know, started helping out in the mosque, you know, whether it be serving niyas to the guests or whether it be, you know, a steward at the Ashura procession. And that involvement gave me you know, a sense of belonging with Imam Hussein. And I, I really thought that, you know, Imam Hussein is where, where I belong. My name is, I've been named after this man, you know. I look up to this man and everything was just, just perfect. You know, Imam Hussein was that, that idol for me that I always looked up to. Obviously, at that young age, um, hearing after Muharram, you know, a lot of people were, you know, making plans. You know, some people are going to Sham, some people are going to... Iraq, Karbala, you know, at that time, these places were open and safe to go to. So, um, Alhamdulillah, I think I was roughly about 10 years old when um, my dad booked tickets for me and my entire family to go to Sham. So, at that young age, I was exposed to Ziyarat. However, at that young age, I still couldn't really grasp the real concept of Ziyarat, where, what it was, what I'm there to do. You know, I, I, I can still, you know, remember like being there and on Arbaeen day seeing so many mokibs, you know, come in front of Sayyidah Zainab's shrine. And I was a bit confused at that age. I was like, what's going on? What, why am I here? And I remember one thing that never left my mind was there was a reenactment of um, the children um, in chains that were being paraded through the streets of Sham. And that never left my mind till this day. And I always asked my dad, I said, why, why are they doing this to them? Because I was at such a young age, I didn't understand that this was a play or this is something that, you know, happened. 
I just said, why are they doing this? This is so unfair. And, you know, I, 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 can, I can still remember. And it was like a really emotional thing to me at a young age. It was, it was traumatic. So of course, at that young age, I was exposed to, to Ziyarat, but still there was questions in my mind that, you know, as I grew older, I was like, oh yeah, I've been to Sham, but I couldn't really remember the experience where I felt any spirituality or anything. So every year goes by and I see so many people, my cousins, friends, um, you know, schoolmates, uni mates, and you know, they're all planning to go to Karbala and I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should go as well. When will I go? So one day me and my sister, we, um, we had a conversation about going to Ziyara, to Karbala. And at that time, I think I was 17 years old, 16 or 17 years old. So I was still pretty young. The only thing that was stopping me from going was literally that Arbain used to happen during uh, school time. So I wouldn't be able to go. So I remember me and my sister, we made a pact and um, she said to me that when, when she was older than me, she's like two, three years older than me. So she said, um, when I go to Karbala, I'm going to make sure I take you as well. So it was, it was like a, a pact that we made that we, if we're going to go, we're going to go together. So I said, fine. And uh, what happened is I think the year after, um, she, she got an opportunity to go and um, I wasn't able to because again, it, it came in exam time. So um, I remember just snagging my parents. My parents said, look, your time will come. You just need to be patient. So I still remember going to drop her to the airport, seeing so many people, kids, elders, you know, people from all, all walks of life, to be honest, you know, going to this experience of a lifetime. And I remember on the way home, after I dropped my sister, I started crying, started crying in the car. And my mom, you know, obviously she was comforting me. She was just saying, you know, don't worry, inshallah, your time's gonna come. And, um, yeah, that for me was like where I knew at that cost so on that journey back, I think it was one of the saddest moments is when you go to drop off the Zawaz of Imam Hussein and you're not going yourself, that is another painful feeling itself. So um, that, yeah, so that day I literally said to myself like, no matter what happens at no cost, next year I have to go. So at the age of 18, Alhamdulillah, I um, managed to confirm that um, my first trip to Iraq for Ziyara. So how this all happened was I called one of my cousins who was also my age, we're like 10 months apart. And um, I said to him, you know, I want to go to Karbala, but I can't go during Arbain because it clashes with uh, my university time. So he said, we don't necessarily need to go at Arbain time. So there's other times in the year which people do take trips. So Alhamdulillah, me, my cousin, you know, we left on this trip. Our families dropped us to the airport. Um, we were excited. We didn't really know what to expect, but um, it's really started to hit us that, you know, okay, our next stop is Iraq. It's Baghdad. Still to this day, I will always say that Qazimin has the most peaceful atmosphere out of all of the shrines. We spent one night there, but that one night was just unforgettable the the scent of the shrine the feel of the shrine you know the the coolness like it sort of it was just like a like a whiff that came across to to us and it was like wow and you know obviously alhamdulillah we was blessed to have a scholar with us who explained and you know gave us details but that was you know one of our most beautiful experiences but of course um alhamdulillah had been blessed to have you know gone uh, to Ziyara for the next three, four years onwards. And um, each time, well, for the first three times, I, I went in Ramadan. And then uh, this last time, I went in Arbain. So Alhamdulillah, this year, um, when I went to Iraq, you know, I went with a group of five to six friends and a few cousins and friends that, you know, we all sort of just met up in Iraq. We didn't really go with any group. We just done it independently because obviously having previous experience um, but this time it was a totally different experience. It was phenomenal. It was the first time I experienced Arbain. 
every time I've been to Iraq for the last three years, I went in Ramadan. So it was more of a peaceful sort of experience. So it was, again, it was like a new experience for me going this Arbaen. We landed um, straight to Najaf and we was, according to like the three day plan to complete the walk of Arbaen, we was, I think one, one and a half days late already. So uh, we knew that we had like a serious sort of task ahead of us if we wanted to reach um, Karbala on Arbaen day. So um, once we landed, you know, we, we, we came to our hotel in Najaf and um, everyone sort of, everyone got ready and, you know, we was, we was absolutely shattered because of the fact that we had an 11 hour stop in Beirut, but we were just eager to get to the shrine. You know, for me, it was like, I was like, you know, my master, Imam Ali alayhi salam is there. Like, I don't want to stay in the hotel, like for even one minute. I've come to see my imam, I'm not going to rest until I see my imam. And all the other boys that were with me, they all felt the same way. So straight away we got there, we done uh, wudu and everything, we got ready. We got our ziyarat books and we literally just head towards the shrine of Imam Ali. For a few of my friends, it was their first time going. So it was like a mixture of loads of feelings. So, um, I mean, as, as we got into the shrine of Imam Ali, I still remember the first time I went into the shrine of Imam Ali, I remember just, just shaking, just looking at the bravest man in the history of Islam, at Imam Ali alayhi salam. So for me, at that moment, I was just astonished. I just looked up and I see this amazing golden brick work art just, just, it was just literally, I, I was speechless. Even now when I think about it, I just become speechless because that's how beautiful the shrine was and is till this day. And I remember just feeling scared because I knew that I'm a sinner. I knew that I'm not someone who's worthy enough to, to even enter inside Imam Ali's courtyard. Like, how have I come this close with, with like the sins that I've committed. Have I come this close to Imam Ali? After we had done a ziyarat with all of my friends, you know, we recited a few nohas because one of my friends, he has a, he has a beautiful voice. So he, we recited a few nohas. And one of the most beautiful things was that he was reciting in Urdu, but people who were Iranian, Iraqi, you know, from, from all over the world, they just stood there and they were listening. And to me, I know one thing, and they only listened because that was just, were all the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, they have no language. We only have one language and that one language is the love of Ahlul Bayt. As we had, um, you know, done all our amals and prayed and everything, you know, we had a few hours literally before we had to set off for the Arbaen walk. We went back to our hotel. We slept for about two, three hours. We woke up for Fajr. We prayed at the shrine of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And uh, just before we left, we you know, just as you see, everyone carrying flags on their walks. So we went out in the streets, you know, looking for flags. And I remember just before I'd set off, um, I spoke to my mum on the phone. You know, she was like, you know, you must be really tired. You guys have slept two hours. You stopped in Beirut for like 11 hours and you guys weren't even allowed out of the airport. So I said, mum, you know, don't worry, inshallah, we're going to be fine. She said, you know, make sure you have breakfast. But because I was just so eager to, you know, start the walk, I said, you know, don't worry, I'll have it later on or something. Funny thing is, as I got to the first pole, a man just literally came to me, walked towards me from a mokib and he literally handed me a piece of bread with uh, eggs inside. And I, at that moment, I was just overwhelmed and I said, you know, like my mom was worried, but the Imam still looked after me straight away where you know, he, he knew that I didn't have breakfast and my mom, this is like, I just felt overwhelmed and humbled at that moment. Why? Because that person didn't know who I am. That person didn't know nothing about me. But that person also didn't know I didn't have breakfast that day, but that person just came and gave me food just for the love of my mom, saying. So for me, the, f the, s the setting stone automatically was just beautiful. Obviously, as we as we started walking, you know, we we realized, you know, it's, this is it's going to be really physically demanding. You know, it's not something that's just, you know, a lot of people are really passionate. Like, you know, we'll do the walk in one day. Like, it it doesn't it's not that easy to do, you know, within one day. But I mean, if you put your mind to, you probably could. But 
realistically it's it's a difficult thing but anyways you know we we started walking a few of my friends who were really passionate they wanted to do the walk barefoot so as we was walking you know we had two three friends who were like kind of left behind because you know everyone's um in their own zone in their own momentum as we were walking we were pretty much midway into the walk already you know we was walking really fast pace and you know we hardly had any stops we stopped probably for half an hour 45 minutes once or twice and you know after a little while we just we stopped at this place it was literally a random place and um it was like a house almost or something and um we said you know we need to sleep for a little while because you know we really just felt really fatigued at that moment and we knew you know that's it like we need to rest before we can go any further even though at the same time we were stressed about the fact that okay we need to get to karbala before arbain day Otherwise, we're gonna miss you know all the all the processions and everything. So we we literally just walked into this um, this little house. It was like a one long rectangle room, and this this guy who was running that mocap literally he just came to us. Obviously, we couldn't speak Arabic, and the only language we knew was you know English or Urdu. One thing that I realized, in fact, that when I came back was the fact that how beautiful it was the way he treated us. We didn't really speak to him because we couldn't speak to him, but he looked after us in every single way. He gave us towels, he gave us water, he gave us food, he gave us pillows, he gave us every necessity you could think of that you would need in a house. And our relationship with him was nothing but Imam Hussein. And that one thing that at that moment what my biggest thing that I learned from that Ziyarat trip was that if I could implement that same thing that we we witnessed and experienced that love and respect for the followers of for the guests of Imam Hussein if we could have that in every Husseinia all over the world then we would be replicating the Arbain walk all around the world and that experience for even people who cannot go and visit but I believe that that's one thing that I, I really learned that respecting the guests of Imam Hussein to such a level even in London where they come to your majlis you should be asking them is there anything we can do for you or can I, can I get anything for you but I feel that is something that I personally learned a lot during that Arbain walk so of course after that day uh, we we set off again, but we noticed that we were short of time, so we had to jump onto like a mini bus. Literally, we jumped onto any bus, and uh, we told them drop us like a few hundred poles just before Karbala because we wanted to, you know, experience the the, the struggle to get to Imam Hussein. Because you know, my previous three times, you know, Alhamdulillah, I had, you know, I would have a taxi taking me from Najaf to Karbala, so I really wanted to experience, you know, the struggle this time and. Um, I remember just, just walking, it was night time and I was absolutely like just so tired at this point. I was like, like literally taking baby steps and um, me, I, I looked at all my friends, you know, they were, they were also really, really tired. And then we saw the sign of Garbala and it said 5,000 meters. And that's when it was like, okay, we, we are nearly there we are nearly at the shrine of Sayyidah Shahada. So at that moment, even though we were so tired, like I just felt like I couldn't walk. But what, the moment I saw that sign, it was like a boost of energy within my soul, within my body. It was like something was just dragging me towards Imam Hussein. Literally, just literally dragging me. I, I, I couldn't even control myself. I was just walking non-stop. There were so many people as we got closer to, to um, the shrine of Imam Hussein. I remember looking left, looking right, you know, thinking, where is the, where's the golden dome? Where's the golden dome? I remember as I, I kept walking straight with my uh, friends and cousins, there I saw the golden dome of Hazrat Abbas, alayhi salam. And at that moment, I did nothing, I did not look left, I did not look right. I just carried on walking and I did not take my eyes off that shrine for at least 15 to 20 minutes as I walked until I got to Hazrat Abbas' shrine. 
And as I got through that last security check post, and I just literally came right in front of the shrine of Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam, where I could see on the left-hand side Imam Hussain alayhi salam shrine. And my friend began reciting a, a noha in Urdu, and um, I just broke down in tears straight away. That moment for me, the struggle to reach Karbala is the beautiful way to do ziyarat because my previous three times I remember reaching Karbala and not, not being able to cry straight away. It was, it was really overwhelming for me. But this time because I experienced a bit of struggle and I, it was like my love that was, was dragging me even though I was so exhausted and my, my friend began to recite and for 15 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes I stood there crying, crying my eyes out, you know. I, I was crying my eyes out as if it was the first time I came. And every time I visit Karbala, it feels like it's the first time I've come. Obviously, we, we tried to go to the shrines, but we just, because there were so many people and it was the eve of Arbain, just, we just couldn't get inside the, the Haram. So that was just really like a, like I was just anxious 24 seven, you know, I was like, I need to get inside, you know, where if somebody was like, you know, I need to go do this or I need to go do that, I would just be like, I need to get inside the shrine. I'm not able to get inside the shrine. So for me, it was just, you know, where I often describe the moment when you grab the zari of Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, it's like as if my soul leaves my body and goes to Imam Hussein. And that moment, it's, it's just something that I can't describe, I can't put to words, but it's something that you can only experience. So getting inside the shrines of Imam Hussain al-Islam and Hazrat Abbas was probably one of the hardest things to do, um, due to the fact that the amount of people that were actually in, um, in the city of Karbala and the amount of people were still that were pouring in. So, um, I remember we, we made numerous plans with, with all the boys, you know, okay, look, let's, let's go in like this or let's go in like that. And uh, I remember what we, what we planned to do was pray Maghrib at, in, in Bain al-Haramain. And I still remember like Bain al-Haramain, you know, praying Maghrib Anisha in Bain al-Haramain was like, everyone was like, there was not even space, you know, to go into sujood, you know, but you just somehow everyone still managed to do it. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about Karbala. It's such a small, compact city, but it caters for so many millions of people. It goes beyond my my thoughts. So um, we we prayed Maghrib, and as we as we finished, we saw loads of mokibs that were going inside the shrine of um, Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam. So we saw um, a group of uh, Pakistani pilgrims that were going in and uh, we, we said, you know, can we, can we join you guys? And they said, yeah, why not? So I still remember we, we, you know, we joined them and we went inside the shrine whilst, you know, uh, reciting poetry, reading noahs and stuff. Um, but at, still at this point, we weren't able to actually go and touch the zari because we were just going uh, from one entrance and the mokhi was literally being told to leave from the other entrance. So um, that happened to us and then we went to Imam Hussain's shrine and the same thing literally happened there. And then suddenly like the day after Arba'in, it was like those millions of people that were there all of a sudden just disappeared and it just really calmed down. So we, we went inside and I still remember like in comparison to when I first went one thing I noticed was the the personal time that you get with the Imams in in uh, less busier times like Ramadan. It's phenomenal because I remember just literally on my knees the first time I went into Hazrat Abbas's shrine. I could walk on my knees and go to Hazrat Abbas. But now, if I was to do that, I would I would get trampled because of the amount of people that were there. But I I still remember you know, going into Hazrat Abbas's uh, shrine just by the Zari uh, with my friends. And um, you, could, you, could feel, you could feel it at that moment, you know, it was, it was a really emotional and sentimental uh, moment for me. And one thing which I was saying that I, I really did miss out on my first three ziyarats was not being able to mourn properly for Imam Hussein as I went 
um, during the time of Ramadan where I was able to mourn for Imam Ali alayhi salam, but I wasn't able to mourn for Imam Hussein alayhi salam when I did visit Karbala due to there not being majlis like in, in the days that I, I was there. There's no other way to get closer to your Imams or to increase your attachment to the story of Karbala by, you know, by, by going to Ziyara and by, by looking at these things, you know. So after visiting uh, all the maqams in Karbala and in and around Karbala, um, you know, it was time to, you know, say goodbye to Imam Hussein once again. And uh, I still remember the first time saying goodbye to Imam Hussein. I obviously, like everyone, I didn't want to say goodbye to Imam Hussein. And um, I remember just walking in Bain al Haramain and I, I kept turning back and looking at the dome of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and just thinking, like, when will I return? Like, I, whenever I've been, I've always asked for one thing for sure, which is, you know, please call me back my Imam. You know, let there not be a year which I do not visit you, my Imam. And uh, I still remember this this one, the first time I went to Imam Hussein Shrine and the first time I left and I turned around and I read in uh, Arabic where it said on Imam Hussein Shrine, Assalamu Alaikum Ya Sayyid al-Shuhada. And that completely broke my heart. Whilst I was uh, walking off and then in front of me I would see Hazrat Abbas Shrine for me, that moment, I just didn't want to leave. It was like a baby leaving his mother. And I was just, just weeping as I was walking off. I was weeping, not knowing whether I will return, not knowing whether this country will still be safe for me to return next year. But that trip, you know, where all of us friends, we had ups and downs within the trip, but that brought all of us together. And with that bond that we made in that trip is something that no other trip can make. This is why I always say to, to youngsters that I know that don't miss out on your chance. Don't delay going to Ziyarat. These places, you don't know when the situation is going to change. You know when you can go. You can make it happen. Imam Hussein will always call you. You just need to make the intention and execute it. Because going to Karbala is a life-changing experience. Karbala opens your eyes. Karbala sparks a revolution in your heart. Karbala makes you want to change. I came back from Karbala and my personal mission was to convince as many people as I can to go. Imam Hussain is not only for Shias. Imam Hussain is for Sunni, Shia, atheists. No matter who you are, being a Husseini is just one thing. There's no race, no color, nothing is involved. So that was my one personal thing that when I came back, I I had in my heart that I'm going to try and take as many youth. I'm going to try and show them, you know, what, what Karbala is about and make them feel the experience that I experienced at a young age. So when I came back from Karbala, my intention was, and my plan was to literally, you know, when, when am I going back next? So Alhamdulillah, since the first time I've, I've been to Karbala, I've been going consistently yearly. And the love of Imam Hussein is just completely, you know, just overflowing within me to the extent where I just thought, you know, everyone deserves the right to know about Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein's sacrifice isn't cheap. So I had an idea where I spoke to my mom and I said to my mom that I want to raise the banner of Imam Hussein on my graduation day, on the stage in front of everyone that's there, people that I've studied with people that I've also told about, you know, Imam Hussein. So she said, that's fine. So uh, my mom made a flag, a velvet flag, a black velvet flag with golden embroidery and golden uh, Swarovski crystals. And she, she wrote Ya Hussein in that flag. The most, probably for me, the most beautiful flag in the world and I still remember lining up just before I got onto the stage and where they said my name and for me it was the proudest moment of my life and 
to this day, the best day in my life is where I raised the flag of Imam Hussein on my biggest achievement in my life so far. So if I was to sum up my experience of going to Zara overall, I would say definitely that it's an unforgettable experience. It's an experience of a lifetime. You know, whether you can go with your family or friends, you know, whoever you go with, you, you know, even if you go with people you do not know, I promise you, you will make friends for a lifetime. <laughs> Let me tell you, Hussein. Let me tell you, Hussein. Let me tell you, Hussein.